Right. So hello uh, everyone, and I'm happy to see here uh, people coming for our uh, seminar, the last uh, before the uh, short break, we have the Passover break, and it's also, as you probably uh, know, uh, Lisa, is that we have the elections tomorrow, so people I think are probably also quite uh, anxious about that, and uh, going now and knocking on the doors to, to get more voters. And uh, but still coming here, so I think it will be good to to talk about other things, uh, more interesting in, in at least in, in some intellectual uh, sense. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and we have uh, our uh, special uh, guest, uh, Professor Elizabeth Lloyd, who is coming uh, only virtually this time as part of the Bar Hillel. Uh, colloquium for the history and, and philosophy of science, which we have in uh, together as a, co a cooperation with uh, the Edelstein uh, Center at uh, the Hebrew University and the Van Leer uh, Institute in Jerusalem. And uh, Professor uh, Lloyd will talk uh, on the evolutionary of the holy boats. Issue that, as you could see in the in our invitation. And we have also a commentator, uh, Dr. Tami Schneider, which we uh, already met here a few times at once as a speaker, as uh, Tami is a postdoc at our uh, institute, uh, where she returned uh, after she made her, our, her master and, uh, and uh, she did her PhD at the University of California, Davis. Uh, professor Lloyd is a professor at uh, Indiana University, as she said, in the Department of Philosophy, Philosophy, History and Philosophy of Science. Her research interests are primarily in the philosophy of biology, general philosophy of science, the role of models in science and gender issues in science. Her books include The Structure of Confirmation of Evolutionary Theory, that's from 1988, The Case of Female Orgasm, Bias in the Science of Evolution, 2005, and Climate Modeling, Philosophical and Conceptual Issues, 2018, which was co-edited with Eric uh, Weinsberg. Recently, she has been working on questions that relate to the role of the holobiont in evolution, a topic we shall here about today. So thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for coming to us and share, our, share your thoughts with us in this uh, virtual uh, way, unfortunately, but we hope to be able to move to, uh, to more real meetings soon. Yes, I was uh, so thrilled to get the invitation and so disappointed I didn't get to come to Jerusalem to see you all there in person, but I'm delighted to be here today. And um, I, I'm going to present um, here. I'm going to take my PowerPoint um, and share a screen with you. Um, uh, and now I'm going to run uh, my PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, uh, right. Um, and uh, this. Uh, this talk involves both some issues that I published with Mike Wade um, almost, uh, well, a year ago, year and a half ago, and it involves uh, something brand new that we're working on right now involving um, the, the squid and vibrio uh, mutualism. Um, and, um, and so I'll get to that towards the end of the talk. So uh, Mike Wade is is my um, colleague here in the biology department at Indiana, and um, we've been investigating the coevolution of microbes um, with multicellular organisms. And so I'm going to go over some of our research. Um, if you want to know more about Wade, uh, this book is a fabulous into intellectual autobiography by him, which is extremely informative about his theoretical and experimental work. Um, and um, the, um, the angle that we're taking on uh, the whole biont um, starts with a simple definition that um, comes from a paper that I co-authored with uh, Kevin Teese and 12 other co-authors in 2016. Um, 
the, this is uh, a very broad definition of a whole biont. Um, it's a term used to describe an individual host, microbial community, um, including all the, what I usually call cooties, uh, viruses, cellular microorganisms, fungi, and so on. Um, and the microsymbionts can be constant or inconstant, can be vertically or horizontally transmitted, and can act in a context-dependent manner as harmful, harmless, or helpful. Uh, so holobionts involve both co-evolved and non-co-evolved species groupings. They, they can have a new species come in at any generation, and they can involve both positive and negative interactions with the microbiome. Um, so that means they can either help or harm the host, and lately we've been dealing with one that harms the host, right? Um, when we say vertical or horizon horizontal transmission, that means that the microbe uh, may be carried on to future generations, either within the genome, uh, within the cell, or, uh, or a set of chromosomes and genes inside the cell, or acquired from the environment um, separately in each generation. For example, in humans, our microbiome is almost completely acquired horizontally, meaning from the environment. Um, so d during vaginal birth, for example, the infant soaks up all kinds of beneficial bacteria and microbes from the vaginal canal and the mother's skin around the breast that help it in its digestion of breast milk. Um, and you might know that there's even an ingredient in breast milk that evolved to feed gut bacteria in the infant specifically. Uh, there's no benefit to the infant, it's just for the bacteria. So it's understood as a neutral uh, uh, co-evolved um, substance for the infant, but as beneficial to the microbe. Um, so the rest of the human mi microbiome is acquired from dirt and food and contact with other human beings, mouths and skin and so on. Um, now in our work on the evolution of the holobiont, Wade and I address the dynamics only of the co-evolved portion. So we're leaving out all of the portions that didn't evolve along with uh, the host, um, in which genes from distinct species evolve against the background of the genes of the other species and often end up being co-adapted despite their belonging to totally different species. And I'm sure you know that um, ants and bees, for example, often live together in social organizations in which the worker bees' interests are sacrificed for the sake of the queen. Um, that's called the eusocial organization. So we've dubbed the most extreme form of co-adaptive combinations euholobionts, uh, which we define as genetically, a genuine genetically integrated, co-adapted communities of obligately mutualistic organisms. And we offer the term demibiont to characterize one-way evolution as opposed to reciprocal co-evolution between separate species. So our definition of a demibiont emphasizes the long-term adaptation by species one two species two, and includes cases in which both species receive benefits from one another, but evolution affects primarily one of those two interacting species. Um, now, we do make a distinction between the so-called genic or cheater point of view, which is the classic, uh, derived from the classic Fisherian um, that's Ronald Fisher, um, Fisherian genetics way to model evolution. It goes back to the origins of population genetics in the 1930s and 40s, and um, what's called the community or co-evolutionary point of view, uh, often called multi multi-level selection point of view, um, which I'm going to explain as we go along, um, and it derives from this uh, Wrightian. A genetics, that's a reference to Sewell Wright, who um, invented these genetics in 1931 and 32. Um, 
And um, people who do, do genetics this way don't often do genetics this way and vice versa. Um, but going on to the genetic uh, point of view, um, it uh, and um, probably the best pub publicist for the genetic point of view um, was Richard Dawkins um, and maybe you could say George Williams, um, uh, possibly others, but the genetic point of view conceives of everything as revolving around single genes operating in isolation as point. And they're assumed to interact individually in evolutionary change to possess evolutionary adaptations, which are design features that increase the evolutionary fitness of their possessors. For example, giraffe's long neck is an adaptation. It's an engineering adaptation for grazing in the tall acacia trees on the African plains. Um, genes for long necks were taken to have evolved because they contributed to the reproductive success of their owners over evolutionary time, gradually making more and more long neck genes appear and be maintained in the population of giraffes. You learned that probably in grade school. When we take genes one by one like this, we and many advocates usually call it the genic approach to evolutionary change. And an important aspect of the genic approach uh, is that when there is competition between genes, for example, when a gene in one organism is pitted against a gene in another organism of the same or different species, perhaps in a case where it's possible for only one organism to survive and reproduce, it's in the interest of that one gene to cheat in any bargain made between cooperating genes. For example, if two giraffes are sharing an acacia tree, but there's only enough for one giraffe. Anything that would motivate one giraffe to cheat on the other giraffe would be selected on this view. Um, so, well, if, a, if cooperation occurs among insects, for example, in a nest, and the insects are not supposed to mate except for the queen, any insect that cheats and mates anyway will have a selective advantage, and those genes will be selected for cheating. The only exception to this is where the queen can discipline the cheater and the cheater insects attempts at establishing reproduction outside the nest will reliably fail. Which happens, according to the theory, under very rare condition. Game theory is used to tell us about these rare and stable equilibria. Thus, cheating is nearly always selected and no cooperative combination is evolutionary stable, um, except under rare and rigorously narrow conditions under this genetic point of view. Uh, this makes it nearly impossible for genuine mutualists, such as holobionts are defined as being, to evolve according to the genetic point of view. This is why genetic selectionists do not generally believe that there are very many mutualists in the world, the whole world. Um, in other words, cheaters are always motivated to cheat on any cooperative agreement over evolutionary time, leading to a lack of mutualists in the world. Thus, it is very surprising under this view of evolution that there are so many apparent mutualists in the world as we know it. Um, are, are they really and truly mutualists? Can they be truly stable? Are, all, are they always just about to fall apart as mutualistic arrangements when we discover them? Um, this is a core question at the center of Fisherian genetic theory of the evolution of holobionts. Um, and it's why so many conventional genetic selectionists, and this is the mainstream theory of genetics today, also known as the selfish gene view, cannot accept that mutualists are genuinely evolved partnerships. Um, so um, Wade and I think though, that there's another alternative and that's uh, part of what I'd like to discuss with you today. It's the community co-evolutionary genetics point of view stemming from Wrightian genetics or multi-level uh, selection theory, um, which takes uh, communities as stable entities genetically. And on this co-evolutionary view, it's possible for genes in different species, uh, separate species to co-evolve together under specific circumstances that are actually quite common. 
not only that, this process is actually a runaway process of selection once it starts, operating as a positive feedback dynamic. Um, this result explains the abundance of real mutualisms that we see in nature. Um, some biologists around 10 or 12 years ago, in fact, they were Israeli biologists, Eugene Rosenberg and Alana Zilber Rosenberg, proposed that holobionts and their genes, that is symbiotic systems encompassing a host in their microbiome, were ubiquitous in the world, were not rare, but rather they were everywhere. Unfortunately, uh, like other multi-level selectionist proposals before it, this proposal was very poorly received. A set of typical arguments was developed against holobionts. Um, and um, uh, we are, for example, uh, offered a set of typical counter arguments against holobiont mutualisms from the genet point of view, which they mockingly describe as the reality of the multi-level selection situation. This is a so-called reality from critics Nancy Moran and David Sloan. And they say hosts must adapt to the reliable presence of symbionts in the same way that they adapt to abiotic components of the environment with little or no selection on symbiont populations need be involved. Um, abiotic refers to non-living parts of the environment like rocks and dirt. In other words, the claim here is that hosts evolve and adapt to their living microbiome the exact same way that they adapt to rocks, despite the fact that the microbiome is full of living beings. Now, in a contrasting view, symbiont theorists, Bordenstein and Tees, assert that biomolecular uh, associations are more conceptually similar to an intergenomic genotype cross genotype interaction than a genotype cross environment interaction. Um, in other words, Bordenstein and, and Tees believe that the relationships between the host and microbiome are more like those between genes on different living chromosomes than like genes in rocks. This is supported by the genetics, which show that genes in one species change when evolved, when evolved against genes in another species which has been established for over two decades in the evolutionary biology of indirect genetic effects, um, uh, apparently unknown to these geneticists. Uh, so uh, in case of whole bions, um, the environment of the gene in question can itself contain genes and when it does, the environment can evolve and become more common. In other words, the so-called environment of the host gene is a microbe, which itself contains genes. Because of this, this leads to reciprocal effects such that an increase in one species can increase the rate of evolution of the other and vice versa. But the second argument against the holobion as a unit of selection and evolution argues that it is likely that if host and symbiont are co-evolving, it is because they are in an evolutionary arms race of genomic conflict. Um, it also follows that under the usual genic and cheater approach, that due to this inevitable arms race, they cannot, except under unusual conditions, co-evolved to have a sta stable and adaptive equilibrium because one will inevitably cheat on the other and destabilize the combination. So these are customarily described as instances of positive feedback. And we also show that this is mistaken under a variety of conditions. Um, here's a definition of an evolutionary arms race. Take a look. Evolutionary arms race struggle between competing sets of co-evolving genes, traits, or species that develop adaptations, counter-adaptations against each other, resembling an arms race. 
These are often described as examples of positive feedback. Um, now, um, we, we do know um, sorry, I'm missing two pages of my text. What I would like to say about this is that um, actually, and in between here is some genetics, but I can give you the point. Um, uh, the, um, uh, in, in the actual gene conflict situation that they describe, the symbiont reduces the frequency of the host genome and in their, in their conflict, the host reduces the frequency of the symbiont genome. If that's what happens, change in frequency of host gene and change in frequency of microbiome gene, both move towards zero. This is the frequency of the gene. This is the frequency of the gene. They both move towards zero. What does that tell you? That's a dis self destruct this mutually assured destruction, right, in, in this dynamic. And um, so uh, we, we think that once the gene, gene conflict is really understood, it's not an arms race. There's no positive feedback. But mutualisms, as understood in community genetics, do have positive feedbacks, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a, in a minute. Um, now, in, on our theory, you have a host microbe combination, which is more frequent than random because of epistasis and interaction with transmission and population structure uh, being positive. And um, what that involves is rewriting S, which is the fitness of the host, as at the fitness of the host plus the fitness of, uh, that you're getting um, from epistasis, and T, the fitness of the microbe, as T plus um, the, the component of fitness from epistasis. And we then extract that and say the epistatic component of fitness does not belong either to the host or to the microbe, but rather to the combination of the host and microbe together. It's a holobiont genotype and it's a holobiont piece or component of fitness. And because of that, you have a genuinely integrated theory of a holobiont genotype and a holobiont fitness that um, will uh, be trouble for the critics of the holobiont um, evolution. Um, um, If we made the epistatic component of fitness explicit, let me go back here. Uh, if we made the um, um, epistatic component of fitness explicit and put it in these equations, um, uh, a component of fitness does not belong to either the host or the micro. Uh, this gives you an idea of a little piece of modeling of our model. I, I have some more slides on this. That, I can show you at the end, but really that's mostly Mike's work. Um, now let's go back and talk about the leading serious critics of holobionts and um, the status of holobionts as unified units of selection. I want to focus on the two most fundamental problems that are raised by the critics. Um, first, we have Angela Douglas and John Warren who acknowledge that selection can act at multiple levels of biological organization. So, you know, they're off to a good start, but they then impose some unusually stringent conditions on such selection processes, stating that the whole genome concept requires near perfect concordance 
of selective interest, both among the microbial partners and between the microbiota and host. In other words, everybody has to have the same interests. Um, as conflicts of interest among partners increase due to weak partner fidelity, and that has to do with how reproduction occurs, then the host microbiome is undermined as a single unit of selection. Um, now, uh, it took me a while to figure this out, but when Douglas and Warren, are, what they're doing here is appealing to a Maynard Smith Zothmary type of hierarchical selection process or model where the lower level of entities suppress their conflicts and unify under a high, higher level. They're not trying to hide this, this is their model. Um, this model of hierarchical selection was developed in order to explain how uh, multicellularity first evolved back in evolutionary time. So it's a problem how to explain how many cells individually, each with their own interests, band it together and suppress those individual interests in order to create a higher order entity, a multicellular entity that itself has a higher order fitness component. Okay, that's hard. And it seems to the critics of holobionts that the holobiont selection problem is identical to that problem, that evolutionary transition problem. That is how to band together multiple entities at the micro level to emerge a higher level community with a higher order fitness. That's how they conceive the problem. That's why they use that model. But um, the key to this argument is that they insist on the suppression of lower level selection because they assume that it would oppose the higher level of selection. They also assume that the lower of level of selection would be stronger, preventing a response to a higher level of selection. This view of Maynard Smith and Zothmary takes a genic approach to higher order selection and seemingly all critics of the holobionts have been operating under this model. But this approach to modeling is not necessary or appropriate and it does not reflect the multi-level hierarchical models that Wade and I appeal to and build our case on. Um, so uh, on our type of model, the lower level selection may be, may complement, and in relevant cases actually amplify the higher level selection forces. In addition, indirect genet genetic effects constitute a source of genetic variation that's often not accessible to individual level selection. So we get new dynamics at the higher level of selection. And finally, heritability for individuals under the genetic view has been shown to be different from heritability for group traits in multi-level selection models. You cannot assume these assumptions work for multi-level hierarchical Wrightian models. And so this is mainly due to the difference between heritability as defined for individuals under the genic selection view and heritability of a group trait in multi-level selection theory. So the effectiveness of group selection experiments without any of the constraints on lower level selection assumed by the evolutionary transition approach indicates heritability of community level traits and selection among communities may play a significant role in the evolution of holobionts. So we found that seemingly all critics of the holobionts have been operating under this mistaken Maynard Smith and Zothmary evolutionary transitions model. And we provided them with a very different approach. Um, with regard to seeing the holobionts as units of selection, technically our analysis yields the following results. Uh, we show holobionts are seen as units of selection in two ways. One, as interactors, where uh, interspecific epistasis is greater than zero, they're interactors, and when their vertical uh, transmission is uh, greater than zero, then we, they can be interpreted as reproducers. 
Um, we showed in our paper that interspecific epistasis uh, is greater than zero. When it is greater than zero, it's sufficient to establish a holobiont as a unit of selection with respect to its characteristics as an evolutionary interactor. And we also showed that any non-zero degree of vertical transmission establishes a holobiont as a reproducer. Um, and we can turn to down, a drown et al. Um, whenever genetic modifiers of the degree of vertical transition, transmission exists, plus some positive inter, interspecific epistasis, genetic variants that favor a higher degree of vertical transmission hitchhike on the spread of epistatic mutations. So that gives us a positive feedback process that's actually a runaway pro positive feedback process of holobiont creation as symbionts, and th that is mutualist. So under these common conditions, the system will trend increasingly towards mutualists, not away from them as the selfish gene story would have it. Still, we may ask, how does multi-level hierarchical selection work in these models? And we do know that under multi-level selection theory, there can be multiple units at multiple levels that are simultaneously under selection at a given time. But how are we supposed to understand how this hierarchical selection model works in the case of holobiont? Now, in ordinary genetics, uh, we understand the function of a gene by introducing errors, that is using knockout genes. And when you knock a gene out and you find the error, you can attribute the function to the gene, uh, more or less. Not guaranteed, but it basically works. Um, so what's the analogy in gene combinations across species? Because that's what you're looking for in these co-op co uh, cooperative groups. The analogy is putting bad combinations together and seeing what doesn't work. Um, instead, uh, genic selectionists use gene combinations to discover evidence of conflict, not as evidence for or against coevolution. In other words, they're not even trying. Um, gene selectionists instead ask what parts of a whole will be in conflict when broken apart from one another. That is, instead of seeing them as parts of a whole that has been broken and remains broken, right? Um, so as a matter of the theoretical practice, backed up by Rice, um, they anticipate that the parts of the whole will be in conflict with one another rather than seeing them as parts of a whole that has been broken and remains broken. Bad combinations are evidence of conflict to the genus. Folks. But instead, we can see how a gene combination fails, falls apart when we put bad combinations together. And we can infer gene coevolution from the bad gene combinations because they are bad. But we would make inferences about gene coevolution from the bad gene combinations because they are bad, just as we infer gene function from genes that are bad functioning. Instead, though, what we have when we have a bad gene combination, the genetic selections tell a story about the two pieces. They're cheating on one another or in conflict with one another. But this does not take the fact of their existing in combination seriously. So is the light bulb cheating on the switch when it doesn't work? Or should we consider the combination as functioning together and possibly broken. We don't say my lamp stopped working because the light bulb is cheating on the switch. We should not be telling these stories about the parts separately when the whole process is the functional level at stake. We can see this clearly by applying my analytical tool, the logic of research questions, to the different programs. On the genetic approach, 
the research questions involve looking for a process of conflict between what are taken to be the fundamental entities, as we can see here in box one. Um, so let's examine what research questions genetic selectionists who rely on cheater dynamics in game theory tend to use when approaching a system they want to understand. Who is out competing who? Who is cheating on who? Who benefits at the cost of who? Who wins this evolutionary conflict? What is the lowest level entity? And so on. Should, uh, and possible and responsive answers to these questions include things like cheaters arrive, arise within a population and spread. There must be many policing mechanisms because otherwise there would be more cheaters. Or females are cheating on males, or males are cheating on females, so on. Um, note all the cheater genes here. And note that it is all about individual genes and their interests, their adaptations and conflictual processes that they're involved in as individuals. And that's how they think it goes. But let's examine how gene selectionists approach a whole low buy-on that they want to understand. They tend to ask research questions similar to those in box one, and I've highlighted one of the possible and responsive answers to questions that you've heard earlier in the talk. Who is cheating on whom? Who wins this conflict? What is the lowest level entity which can be cheated as an evolving population? Um, and uh, the answer is, one of the answers is that mutualisms are evolutionarily unstable owing to genomic conflict. Um, but we've already addressed this issue with our epigenetic models and challenged this type of answer to the gene question. But consider the research question. What is the lowest level entity which can be treated as an evolving population and what are its evolutionary interests? The question posed here is a version of the parsimony method advocated originally by Williams and then by Maynard Smith to avoid the perils of group selection. Moran and Sloan appeal to Williams's 66 view, arguing that holobionts are being presented as undergoing selection, much like the early and oversimplified views of group selection, which failed to recognize that population adaptations are unstable under most circumstances due to susceptibility to invasion by selfish individuals. And they cite Williams. Uh, similarly, Douglas and Warren invoke both Williams' parsimony concept and his averaging reasoning about epistasis. You'll recognize the appeal by selfish gene selectionists in these accounts and their confidence that all correct accounts lead to selfish genes. Um, now, it's important to know that much later, uh, many years later, Williams in 1990 admitted that his parsimony method was not in fact the best or most appropriate method to deal with multi-level selection debates. In his review of Lloyd 1988, he instead endorses a multi-level selectionist approach to group selection that a, that against his prior commitments and recommendations regarding parsimony, quote, makes more sense than any other I have seen. Maynard Smith later also agreed. But what is a viable research alternative to the traditional or gene-oriented approach? In studying coevolution from a community gen genetics perspective, we engage different research questions, which yield a different set of possible and responsive Answer. Uh, so we have box three from coevolutionary community genetics. The question, the overall question is, what is a well-functioning interspecific gene combination? That's a gene combination between species. And you can ask more specifically, what is interspecific epistasis? How can it be measured? And what happens to poor gene combinations, or what is the level of vertical transmission? And possible and responsive answers to these questions include well-functioning gene combinations or co-adaptations with the whole biome as beneficiary, and so on, as you see here. Um, then we get to some clear conditions of gene combinations participating in 
community evolution where the um uh where we can um sum up something that we find from the logic of research questions in community gen genetics uh right here where if the switch is broken the lamp does not work if we say cheating we imbue the switch with an inappropriate property and analogous categories under good gene combinations would be functioning switch and light bulb and all other combinations are just poor combinations with low fitness so the logical research questions uh, tells us that the process of selection creates non-random associations with epistasis or pleiotropy it's bad for the host or vice versa if it's bad for the host or vice versa they do not build up any associations and they dissipate there's no reproduction process of at selection at a higher level explains this you may say this is all fine and good as a philosophical or scientific analysis of the research questions but what happens in the real world and now i'll tell you a couple of uh, years ago, a group of 14 leading genic theorists interested in and committed to cheater dynamics developed some stringent fitness tests to uncover cheaters in nature. That's their own words. And they took their standard of fitness out into nature to discover the real cheaters in a well-funded survey. They tested the exemplars of cheaters in nature that they had been teaching in their classes and studying in their labs all these years. And uh, what happened in the wild? Uh, they came back with virtually nothing, the big donut. None of these systems showed the fitness relations re required to demonstrate actual cheating. So what happened? Did they uh, abandon the cheater idea? Did they adopt or even consider a more community-oriented multi-level idea like ours or other related ideas? No, not at all. Instead, they committed to a new theoretical and empirical program of looking for the policing for cheaters that must be happening in order to explain the lack of cheaters. So as a philosopher, you know, I think Sir Karl Popper, the philosopher who argued for the importance of abandoning scientific theories when they were false by, he's rolling in his grave. In sum, Moran and Sloan ask, what is the null hypothesis when we're talking about holobionts? And after acknowledging that many features of multicellular organisms cannot be understood without taking into account microbial associates, they asked, but how should we formulate our questions and hypothesis? And we agree that this is the essential issue at stake. But we think the problems have been misconceived in terms of an inadequate research program, misleading research questions in terms of conflict, cheaters, and the gene approach, rather than in terms of coevolution, epistasis, and community genetics. Um, however, Moran and Sloan argue that the wrong approach is to start with the assumption that associated organisms have evolved to function as a cooperative unit and that the task is simply to characterize mutually beneficial adaptations. Moreover, they advance the view that a more parsimonious approach, and there you see Williams again, is to adopt the null hypothesis that interacting lineages have not evolved exceptional whole genome selected traits and to test specific hypotheses regarding such traits. Um, note that this argument is advanced in terms of parsimony, just as Williams had argued over 50 years ago against group selection in an argument that he later abandoned. When instead, the units of selection questions are distinguished into their separate roles or functions in an evolutionary change, we get at least two distinct possible roles for holobionts, interactor and reproducer, which can appear along these continua of Demibiont to holobiont. And 
Um, we, we think that whole bonds are distributed along these uh, continua. And um, what, what's happened is that the overall strategy of holobiont critics has been to take extreme versions of holobionts along these two continua and say these are uncommon and conclude therefore that no, there's nothing new here to be understood. Um, the strategy is analogous to only studying new social organisms such as honeybees and their queens and workers and conclude that since the social organization is uncommon, Therefore, all other forms of sociality, including intermediate forms, are uncommon. Well, you know, we'd be the first to say that the U-holobion is uncommon, but insist that regular holobions in between demimions and U-holobions are nearly universal. And the conceptual approach to understanding them ought to be different from the gene-centered, species-centered perspective founded on the principle of genome conflict. Um, so finally, uh, let's take a close look at a case uh, that has been uh, repeatedly advanced as the exemplar of a holobiont. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, sorry, we have very little time since you could be very uh, short on that. It's uh, appreciate. Oh, right. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I got sort of messed up because I lost my paper. Um, yeah, um, let me uh, just uh, go advance um, to uh, the um, conclusion of this talk. Um, oh, okay, the claim is that Vibrio and Squid are holobionts and that they're fully, uh, they both experience adaptations to one another. I, uh, I examined some of these claims um, and like that evidence that um, these uh, uh, special novel functions served by served by by Vibrio in the Vibrio squid mutualism are going to be um, full adaptation. Um, and I point out that one of the main ones that's in the literature is not actually an adaptation, it's an acceptation, which makes the associated pairing a demi-biont, not a whole biont. Um, okay, so in sum, um, uh, our, uh, now Mike White has dubbed uh, our little corner of new genetics models, syngenetics. And Syngenetics predicts many mutualists, few cheaters, many transitions from parasitization to mutualism. That's our predictions. Genic models predict many cheaters, few mutualists, no transitions from parasitism to mutualism. Uh, we argue that the squid vibrio case is a mistaken exemplar. And um, the actual facts from nature are that there are many mutualists and no cheaters many transitions from parasitism to mutualism. So we take that as all good signs from nature for us in genetics models. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much and sorry for for, for rushing you at uh, the end, uh, but I think we got the, uh, the ideas uh, in, in the talk itself and uh, we'll have uh, Tommy uh, opportunity to, to comment so please let me put let me put everybody back where i can see yeah. okay thank you much okay um wait a minute just a second so thank you lisa for a very interesting and intriguing talk um uh, first of all, I want to say that I was fascinated by the way you show the logic and research question and the model assumption constrained the research on holobion evolution by shaping the very type of questioning, specifically to this debate, uh, uh, the search for cheaters uh, versus the cooperative collaborative patterns that will facilitate two different paths of questions. The genic cheaters point of view that presupposes the default behavior such as cheaters and the community co-evolution point of view that may be default uh, mutuality. So interestingly, you show how the bias towards community and co-evolution point of view 
is better in giving explanation to the phenomena of complex systems of mutuality because it opens more possibility. So it's uh, epistemically uh, uh, better. Um, so uh, you also show how the logic of research question explains beautifully why the criticism on the hologenome theory places the unit of selection as necessary condition. The unit of selection is important to the, in this criticism because of the assumption of cheaters and the need to control them, therefore the need to have stable unit. Thus rejecting other options such as multi-level selection or group selection is less stable. Um, it is interesting to me how in this view, mutualistic relations always considered to be coerced to some degree and not possibly promoting self-interest. And uh, the thought that cooperation and community uh, do not involve self-interest and promote cheaters. This limits the option and the number of choices that involve self-interest. So looking at communities and cooperation as self-interest allows for more options to exist that promote self-interest either in mutualist, uh, mutuality or cheating. It happens that in nature, we see more of the, uh, of the former. So, um, so this is how uh, your um, uh, example sh show that bias, uh, basically both uh, point of view have this uh, uh, different bias, but one bias is epistemically better. Um, another thing that I want to point, uh, point out is um, this uh, scale of uh, eulobiont and uh, demibiont that focuses on the level of coercion of uh, interactions and uh, adapt adaptation reciprocity or co-adaptation. So on the one hand, you have the eulobiont that are communities of obligately mutualistic organisms where the individual organism or more likely the species population sacrifice their self-interest for the sake of the community. And on the other side the scale, of the scale, we have demi holobiont which characterizes one way uh, of evolution where one species adapt to, to the other with the possibility of both, both species receive benefits from one another. So we have focus on level of uh, uh, dependencies versus autonomy. So one focus on level of coercion or coercive interactions and the other looks at reciprocity or lack of reciprocity of adaptation. So I wonder if there is a presupposition that adaptation entails uh, necessarily uh, coercion. And I think to some degree, when organisms adapt to environment uh, or other organisms, there are relation of dependency. But the concept of coercion might not be the right concept in describing the situation of such relations because it assumes that any individual organism or species population uh, in nature exhibit autonomy to some degree. This is clearly not the case when looking at ecological uh, systems and the relation of interdependency with, uh, within them. So for example, even the platonic vibrio um, the symbiont that uh, lives uh, in, in mutualistic relations with uh, the squid do not depend on the environment, uh, uh, depends on the environment for its uh, nutrients or depends on the squid uh, light organ for its nutrients. So when thinking about coevolutionary processes and the dynamic in complex network of interactions, we can see different levels of, of adaptations on different scale uh, scales, especially in the case where there are large multicellular organisms and microbes. The evolutionary process of microbes and the multicellular organisms are very different on a time scale and different in their versatile yes. dynamics. Yes. I have a microbial ecologist friend who made the analogy of microbial uh, evolution and multicellular evolution uh, to driving a Ferrari versus driving a Vespa. Uh, the microbial evolution is much more versatile and dynamic than ours. So it's driving the Ferrari. And so host organism who have, uh, have to adapt and develop the ability to incorporate and live in, in this pool or soup of microbes. Um, so we are the one who, who are driving the Vespa. Um, 
So the mi microbes are integral, integral parts of our environment and changes our environment through their metabolic interactions. And so, so also it is important to understand the ecological constraints uh, in effect working in the process of microbial evolution that is much faster and volatile than ours on the one hand, but also exhibits some stable communal functioning structure on the other hand. So the process of coevolution of genes from distinct species that evolves again the, against the background of the genes uh, of one another should not be aimed at only two species, of course, because in fact, in nature, we have complex communal system interacting uh, in and within their environment, especially the holobiont, which is uh, the complexity of interactions of host and microbes. Um, so my question is how to understand the dif this different uh, processes of evolution in context uh, of coevolution of such different uh, scales, both size scales, we have macro uh, organism, multicellular organisms, and uh, micro microorganisms, and but also um, so it's not also it's not only size scales; it's also time scale. Uh, one exhibits uh, a faster processes or more volatile processes of of uh, evolution than the other. And also, uh, in what ways uh, do you think ecological perspective can contribute to such understanding of coevolutionary processes of network? of interactions. Well, well, let me start at the end, Tammy. Thank you for all your insightful comments. I'm very interested in what you had to say. Um, that really um, was a, a couple of steps forward on the analysis. So that was very helpful. Um, the, uh, I, I'll, I'll start with the end. Um, uh, in my view, a, uh, uh, w well, um, Community genetics actually comes from ecology um, and, and an ecological setting. So it's, it's in, within ecological theory now that community genetics is actually developed and used. Um, this is sort of funny because, uh, well, it, it, it goes along with its kind of meandering background in the history of genetics, which is quite complicated because it goes back to Sewell Wright, who is one of the founders of modern genetics. Um, uh, but uh, it, it, the people who took up his more complicated form of genetics, which was multi-level and so on, um, and not straight ahead like the big Fisherian genetics, um, were people who had interest in ecology and were trying to model ecological aspects of their populations. And so there's a sense in which the, uh, the environment is kind of built in, in a way, to the interests of community models. Um, they could well be made much more explicit and much more included in a more visible way. So I, I think that's a great idea, but um, I, I just wanted to tell you that the people who are in this kind of community genetics um, are well primed to encourage uh, inclusion of more ecological aspect because that's its, that's its literal home these days um, as a genetics practice. Um, uh, also, the farm, um, the, the two places where you see Rydian genetics rule the roost are in ecology and agriculture, interestingly. Um, but, but going back to the, uh, uh, I mean, I think this is also partly a, an answer to the, the kind of, uh, I, I think of it as scale problems um, that are, that have to do with the time and the space and the, and so on um, of, you know, what do you do with a organism like us that might live to be 60 or 70 or more and um, a set of, uh, and a microbiome that might live to be 30 minutes or two days, you know, um, how do you cycle 
the microbiome through a macrobe that is uh, six years old. Um, how does that work? How does the evolution of that work? Um, and one of the answers is that the, evolu the way the evolution of that works is that uh, we trade out our microbiome uh, maybe once every five years or sooner um, with our environment. Um, so it gets changed over um, somewhere between five and every five and 10 years. Um, uh, so, so I find that kind of interesting. I, I mean, I've been keeping an eye out for um, kind of more information about scale. Um, but I don't know how to model it yet. And I, we, we don't know how to handle it in our models yet. So um, I, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you about that. Um, but the, uh, some, some of the other issues that you, that you brought up about, for, for example, about the logic of research questions. Um, when, I, um, when I laid out for Wade, my uh, contrary set of research questions and answer, possible answers, and the possible answers were not fully listed yet because he, he knew many more po possible answers than I did. Um, I just was trying to clarify to myself and get right to myself what was happening in the genetics. And uh, he told me when the paper was finished, it was his p favorite part of the paper, actually, um, because it provided a clear alternative to the genic cheater theory um, because it made clear that you really are making vast choices in your research between having um, a, uh, a research question that begins who is cheating on who and uh, a research question that starts what is a well-functioning interspecific gene combination in your system? What is it doing for you? Um, how, how deep is the interspecific epistasis? How do you measure it? Um, you know, the, those research questions just couldn't be further apart. And the people who can answer the genic ones cannot think of how to answer the community gen genetics ones. Uh, I mean, I've talked with them about it and they're like, I don't even know how to start answering that question because they've been totally trained to one set of research questions and, and don't have flexibility to move over to the kind of research question that we're trying to build um, here. Uh, we, 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 I, and I didn't, I didn't have a prediction about that. I didn't think, oh, they're never going to get it, or they are. This is going to be easy for them. I didn't have a prediction about that. But what I did find out was that it was almost impossible for them to make the switch um, because the training was so deep. Because no matter how hard they tried to think of it in this, in this mutually beneficial way, in a mutualist way things would turn into cheat detecting. Um, no matter what, it was all about the selfish gene because that's the framework. I mean, they grew up, literally grew up with that framework. And it's very hard to get out of your mind once it's because it's like some kind of earworm. Um, it's very hard to get out of your mind. Um, but, but that's what we're asking for. You know. Uh, uh. Okay. Um, thank you. So I think there are a few questions in the audience. Uh, if you uh, can move to Eud. Oh, Eud, where are you? Hi, Lisa. It's uh, it's a great. Um, okay. Well, I'm here. <laughs> uh, 
see you. Can you see me? <laughs> where, are, where are you? Uh, it's great. It's great to have you. Oh, well, I don't know. I can keep on talking and maybe. Oh, I'll there you are. I found you. I found you. I found your screen. Oh, I found you. <laughs> okay, good. Here. Great. Here. Great. <laughs> Okay, so so it's 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 great to have you with us, and uh, thank you for your uh, fantastic talk. And I really like the paper uh, that was already published. And now I'm looking forward uh, to the next installment. And uh, thanks, Tommy, for your uh, very insightful comments, which uh, I guess uh, overlap with many of my own. So I'll, I'll try uh, to be coherent and and short. So. so it, I, I think our, our approach is, is, is very similar in general, uh, reflects what I, I tried to define as the Holobind structure of evolution, which is a specific combination of multi-level selection and, and co-evolution. So it's not one or the other, but a, very, a specific combination, or at least potentially, which I think explains continuum, but you, well, continue on, you, 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 you suggested. Oh, oh, uh, it should be so, with the, oh. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's uh, I, I think uh, uh, Nancy Warren and, and, and others because it's, it shouldn't be either one or the other. These are not two mutants mutually exclude uh, uh, in evolution. You can have both. And, and uh, which brings me to the ecological perspective and, and uh, which I've, I've, I, I've been trying to reference according to some ideas that uh, Tami suggested. And, and, and I think one way of, of thinking about this structure of uh, whole balance is that the host is both a home as well as a genome. So the host is the ecological context in which a lot of operation among the microbes and so on. And, and, and I think this, this allows us to, 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 to realize why the dynamics that we should expect what the term vanilla co-evolution. It's a specific kind of co-evolution. Right? You, it's you, evolution in which the host... Hmm? You, you were cut. You, I'm you breaking up. The host is both the... Uh, the genetic and the gene and the and the environment and then your cat. So if you can repeat on that. Okay, I, I said that the, the oh, okay. So that was the best part. The host is both the home as well as a genome. So that was the the the, the bumper sticker version, right? Uh, so it is an ecological system, and which is why uh, we should think about the processes and the mechanisms specifically in the host that developmentally handle this cooperation. And I think just a genic approach, whether it is uh, uh, a selfish genic or a clinic, both of them uh, should be augmented with thinking about development. That, that would be my uh, key point, because there are mechanisms that handle and determine which symbiotic relationships. Uh, so, which are typically called in the theory partner choice mechanisms, right? And yeah. there, is a, there is some fear of that. Which leads me to conclude with where I have maybe different or maybe not different predictions uh, than you suggest. I'll, I'll, I'll be interested in knowing which. Uh, so I, I think that uh, we are going. One, one thing I know that we are in agreement with, because you mentioned it explicitly, is that there will be a large role for acceptations or pre-adaptations, right? And right, I think right. if we look just at uh, empirical cases, we know that this is the case, right? We know that this is the case. Uh, um, however, I think if we look at the partner choice mechanisms that are themselves typically acceptations, we will find mechanisms that are sensitive to the contribution of the microbes to the holobiont. So these will not be just simple mechanisms. The mechanisms themselves will have these sort of sensitivity to the contribution and thus we will have these feedback loops and so on. 
Uh, so we have things like the immune system that regulates symbiosis. We have ways of attracting partners and expelling them and so on. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think this seems to me that this prediction is different than what, what I termed vanilla coevolution. Vanilla coevolution, you'll, you'll have a coevolutionary uh, approach which need not end up with specific goal-directed mechanisms. You, you can have uh, uh, very tight relationships that are not sensitive to the contribution of bacteria. And whereas I think what you end up uh, are these goal-directed mechanisms. So I wonder if, 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 if you, you, you agree, and if not, where, where you think uh, my reasoning is incorrect. Well, I, uh, you, you broke up a bit when, uh, to m my hearing, uh, so I couldn't hear all of it, um, actually, Ehud, but I, um, I think I know what you, what, where you were going with that. And I think that um, the issues of partner choice are very complicated, as you say. And I think there's room for what, well, basically a whole variety of relationships to be emerging from partner choice. Uh, acceptations, adaptations, neutral things uh, that, that are not fitness related, uh, because of course, acceptations are fitness related, they're just not adaptations. Um, but you can have neutral things that are not fitness related that actually um, are important um, to partner choice. And so um, I think you could have a whole uh, s spectrum of relationships um, that would come into play there. So I think you're right that it's complicated and um, it may not be on a single spectrum, um, but I, I would be perfectly open to um, uh, complicating things there with uh, you know, full adaptations, full holobiont relationships, or you, or, or what I call demibionts, or uh, or what we call demibionts, and um, um, I think that I would agree with uh, your characterizations of these relationships, Ehud. From what I heard uh, from you, I didn't disagree with anything that you said. Uh, okay, great. So, so ju ju just to, to, to clarify, maybe this part was, wasn't, uh, I was broken up or, or uh, I, I think we should think about the processes of construction of the holobiont in a more sort of developmental perspective. Yes. And I think this allows us to, so you, you suggested, and I think very correctly, uh, 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 that we need to distinguish between different cases and, and which you termed uh, the de demi bion and whole bion and, and, and I, it's, it's, that, it's, it's even more, more complex than that, right? But I think one, one axis would be the developmental uh, perspective. And I think the, the, the what I would call a U whole bion or, or let's just say the interesting case uh, it would be that the one in which the construction is sensitive to conditions, uh, to ecological conditions, and 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 so on. And and I think these are the the, the, the richer cases uh, that are more interesting in terms of evolutionary novelty. Let, let, let's say. Oh, uh, I I would hesitate to say they're the most interesting, but. Um, I do think that investigating the developmental processes involved in putting a holobiont or a demibiont or a holobiont together um, are essential to understanding holobionts, absolutely. Um, and I actually think that that's part of why we wanted these two continua uh, mapped out so that people, people could begin investigating how do you end up here on the continuum instead of there? Um, what makes a difference to that? Um, how do you end up there? What, what is the meaning of that in terms of going from a regular organism running your own business to becoming involved in somebody else's fitness, right? Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think that uh, uh, I would eagerly endorse 
an investigation into the development of all of the organisms that are involved in uh, mutualism. Absolutely, yes. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn. Lynn? Yes, yes, just I unmuted myself. Uh, actually, I would like to take a step backwards to a more generalized uh, question. Uh, which for me, I'm, I'm not a biologist or a philosopher of biology, but for me, it really stands out in your talk. Uh, and that's the status of metaphor. I assume it is not surprising. And it's, it, it is hard to miss on the, or to ignore the fact that these two series of metaphors uh, one uh, starting with the selfish gene and uh, and uh, cheating and arms race, et cetera, et cetera. And the other one um, uh, with, with the community approach uh, that, that you advance uh, are reverberating or echoing a series of other cultural metaphors that we use either in political theory or in, in other fields. And I wanted to ask you, it seemed to me at one point, but I wasn't sure uh, that you're trying to suggest that maybe uh, the, the gene perspective metaphor, the series of metaphors belonging to the, to the gene perspective is our bad metaphors and the other are maybe uh, more adjusted. And I wanted to ask you in which terms you would say that these are better metaphors. Is this because they provide better epistemic explanations or like how would you define uh, what makes a, a better metaphor in this specific argument? And then I actually had another question, but maybe it's a smaller one. And I address it to Ehud and Snaid actually, because I've been listening to you in the past few years and I know that you're talking about collectives and I wanted maybe if you can uh, explain to, to us Philistines, what's the connection between what Lisa is suggesting with a, a community approach and your collective, like if you could explain to us um, what, what's the, like, how do you see the, the connection. So these are my questions. Thanks. So should I answer the first question first and then yeah. yes, move please. it? Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll answer the first question first. Um, I was first uh, exposed to the ordinary genetics way of doing things, which was with the selfish gene um, when, when I was 20 or so, actually probably more like when I was 15, but I didn't pay attention. Um, and, um, and when I was in my mid twenties, I, uh, no, it was earlier than that. I uh, was exposed to much more about the genic approach and how uh, it was uh, supposed to work uh, to decode the biological world. And I, uh, not coincidentally, was studying with uh, Richard Lewinton, um, who is an opponent of the selfish gene approach to genetics. Um, I didn't need Richard Lewinton, though, to have already decided before I went to study with him that I didn't like the approach. I thought that it was bad biology. Um, I thought that it cut corners on biological mechanisms. And so I thought it was sort of kindergarten, uh, uh, simplified, oversimplified biology that was sort of trying to pose itself as real biology. And so when I went up to study with Lewinton, I told him this and he just laughed at me um, and just, you know, was like, 
so join the club and do you want to read my stuff on this? And I was like, yes, please. And so I did. And I thought, well, I'm kind of late to the party, I guess. But um, I, I see that there's other people who are serious geneticists or better known as the best geneticists in the world who actually think this stuff is as much crap or more crap than I do. Um, so uh, I basically grew up out of grad school thinking that this was that this metaphor led to very shortcutty, lazy, bad biology. And um, I also study with Mark Feldman, who is one of the other major geneticists in the world. And uh, we were talking about how evolutionary psychology was using the selfish gene approach and how they were mangling kin selection uh, genetics. And so we wrote a paper <clears throat> attacking the genetics that was used by evolutionary psychologists. Um, and so I've been in the business for a long time of uh, criticizing uh, the lazy use of uh, genic, genic theory by people who should uh, do better science than they're doing. Um, so I come in with an attitude about that, I admit. Um, <clears throat> but there's a reason behind it, which is that I think it leads to bad science. Um, so so that's my, that's the source of my attitude that you picked up about why I don't like selfish gene. Um, I think it leads to bad science. And here it is again, appearing again in the Holobion debate, prompting bad science. Um, so, you know, it's not a surprise to me, it's just annoying to me. Um, so, so of course I'm gonna go after it. But I, I mean, you know, the, uh, what, I, what I'm really trying to do with it in, in this context is demonstrate that they have created a problem for themselves that they can't solve. And if they would only let go of their assumption, they could solve it. But they stubbornly hold on to, you know, the strap of leather they're, they're needing to move and holding on to it while they're trying to take a step. I mean, they just won't let go. And it's, uh, a vivid case of that, I think, here in this context. And so I wanted to make that vivid for people. Uh, that, that's why I use the metaphors the way I do in this paper. Um, does that make any sense? Yes, definitely, it does. Thank you. And thank you. I before before I give I, I let uh, Snaith or I would uh, add some comments on, on your second question. I want to follow up uh, Lynn's question on the metaphors uh, for, for you, Elizabeth. The, the, it's there. There are two ways to think of looking on, or, or there are not two ways. There are two levels in the sense of the metaphor or the, or the approach. The approach that you're attacking is the approach, a very individualistic one. So we have the gene or the indiv individual gene in the, in the individual is even uh, uh, um, not animal organism, which we have to, uh, as the basic component for, for uh, examination. That, that's one point. But then you use many times, uh, you call it as the, as the cheating. And the cheating gives you another thing which is not only the idea, so it's not only the fact of our view, it's also kind of uh, some, it gives them some kind of uh, f finalism or uh, like uh, the, fi the, the final causes in the, in a, in a kind of uh, Aristotelian thinking in the sense that they have, they, they know what they wanted to, to do, which is against the mechanism mechanistic uh, approach, we usually try to think about um, evolution. Uh, and then one of the questions is how is as much there is a real 
tension there and how much these people really use that phrase. So if it's given a little bit too much to them, and how much does it common? Is it common to, to use it? Um, uh, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for that question. Um, I ha am always shocked at how much they use that word um, when I go into one of their discussions or their talks. Um, they talk about cheating, 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 cheating all the time. And um, they use it uh, to shoot down every cooperative suggestion from anywhere of anybody. Um, and <clears throat> I, uh, uh, I, I guess that I'm always so surprised that they do that, that I put it in my paper because they do that. Um, and, and so I was just following their practice. Um, <clears throat> but about the teleology, I think that's what distinguishes the selfish gene folks from other geneticists, um, is that uh, to the extent that they follow Dawkins, and a lot of them do, uh, Dawkins is a teleologist about genes. I mean, he believes that all of this is for the beneficiary of the of the uh, of the replicator, um, and um, I can give you citations on that uh, if you want, um, or it's in my eighty-eight book. Um, he he thinks that all of this is for the purpose of the replicator and the long long endurance of the replicator. He has a very teleological view. And to the extent that the people who do take the selfish gene really take it up, they absorb and demonstrate that same teleological view. I'm really glad you mentioned that because it is contrary to an ordinary mechanistic view. It's with a purpose. Thank you. We will have Short time for uh, either uh, Ud or uh, Snake. Want to comment on uh, Lynn's question? I, I I don't want to take a lot of time. Hello, Lisa. <laughs> Hello. I, thank you for for a really wonderful talk. Really, thank you very much. So glad to see you. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> glad to see you. Um, I don't want to take more time because maybe somebody else could squeeze in a question. So all, all I would say is that um, it's more than a question of metaphors. It's a, it's a more general, what I would call Weltanschauung or a, a, a general view of things in general, not just in biology, but in general, whether you, you look for uh, if you start from the point of view of discrete entities that are isolated, or you start from a point of view where you think about entities in interactions, reciprocating in interactions, and therefore forming all sorts of uh, collectivities, communities. And, and so if you start from there, then a host of metaphors uh, is attached to each each of these views, and the choice which uh, which uh, word view you you select then would lead you to to look at things differently, and lots of things evolve from there. And I, I don't want to elaborate on that because I really would like to give a chance to another person to talk rather than elaborate on that. Uh, I, I'm afraid that, we're, yeah, thank you very much, Nathan, and, and, but I'm afraid that we are, in any case, we are, we are running out of our time, so thank you, even, even given the, the, sh the short uh, discussion, but I think we, we got a very interesting uh, talk and uh, discussion until now, so that will be uh, enough for this uh, evening, and I want to thank you again, uh, Professor Elizabeth uh, Lloyd and Dr. Uh, for, for your interesting talk and uh, Dr. Tammy Schneider for her interesting comments and the for the discussion that we had after that. And we will uh, reconvene here after the Passover uh, vacation. We hope to have it in the, uh, the opportunity to come into the campus after the, the vacation. It's, we didn't get yet the approval, but it will be probably, uh, it's oh, probable that we'll be get, getting that. 
and of course also through the we, we will also have it uh, online uh, through the zoom and uh, we will uh, let you know uh, when we know it. and uh, this we know that the, the speaker will be Ahmed Dobria uh, that will talk in Ibn Khaldun and so we move to a different uh, time period uh, so until then we will have uh, You'll, you'll go tomorrow to, to do the little bit that we can do in the political scene and uh, try to enjoy our uh, vacation uh, after that. So see you in two weeks and thanks again for the speakers. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Temi, for your lovely, brilliant comments and everyone else too. Thank you, Ehud. I really enjoyed hearing what you had to say. And um, all, everybody, thank you. Thank you so, so much. much.